Good day. This is Brother Medina for Tuesday, Seventh Day Adventist. And please let us start with a word of prayer. Gracious, loving Father, please send thy Holy Spirit upon our hearts that we may understand your word and bless us with the wisdom of the truth and help us to be more holy, to be more righteous, and to have a spirit of holiness with us as we prosecute your works and do the things you want us to do. All for your glory's sake we pray, through Christ our Savior. Amen. Well, today we want to talk about holiness. Holiness of demeanor. We want to talk about how one carries himself in the work of God. Yes, my dear people. Now, why are we saying this? We are saying this because you look on the television, you see ministers allegedly preaching the gospel so-called and when they are finished they are closing with a prayer and their eyes are open as if they're just watching you talking to you when they are praying to God there seems to be this lack of reverence this lack of holiness this lack of a spiritual solemn demeanor in ministers they, they are often jokers. They are often not serious and seem not to be truly dedicated to the Lord, but more dedicated to money. But we need to have a spirit of holiness as we do the work of God. Let us look, therefore, at some scriptures that helps us to understand the spirit we are to have as we are doing the work of God. If we look at Leviticus chapter 21 and we will read verse 4, verse 6 and verse 8, here is what we are told. I quote, But he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people to profane himself. Now this is telling us about the high priest of Israel and he was supposed to have a chief spiritual experience, a spiritual experience to strengthen people. So we are being told here that he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people 
to profane himself. So the priest must be holy in his demeanor. How he carries himself, he must have a spirit of holiness. He must not defile himself. He must not destroy his image. Now it goes on. As we look at verse 6 and verse 8, it says this. They shall be holy unto their God, and not profane the name of their God, for the offerings of Yahweh made by fire, and the bread of their God they do offer, therefore they shall be holy. Now what is this telling us? You have the priests, the high priests, and they offer sacrifices made by fire, and they offer the bread of God, the shoe bread, and other bread. They offer the bread of God. Now, when they are doing such thing, we are told they must be holy, because you are doing sacrifices before God. These things here, if we take it spiritually, we would see that those who are in the truth offer sacrifices of righteousness, sacrifices of dedication, sacrifices of totally giving themselves over to God. So they must be holy. You cannot be dedicated to God and have this spirit of jokiness, this spirit where you're not sanctified and you're not solemn, like if you're contemplating about the graces of God in your heart. And even more, bread symbolizes the word of God. Christ says that he is the bread of life. Eat my flesh and drink my blood and you shall have life in you. That he meant spiritually. Because he says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The flesh profited nothing. So it did not mean literally eat his flesh and drink his blood but it meant it spiritually. And since that flesh is the word of God, and the word of God is the bread of God, then if a person is handling the word of God, he must be a sanctified holy person. Could you imagine you're a minister of the gospel and words come out of your mouth which is unsanctified? You are in the presence of people and you're saying all sorts of common things to try and be identified as being one with the people, but yet the people are unsanctified and you are trying to identify yourself as an unsanctified per person with unsanctified people. When you handle the word of God, and if you handle the word of God, you must be more holy in your demeanor. If you handle the bread of God and sacrifices to God, then you must have a sense of holiness you must have a sense of reserve from practicing common trifle things that cheapen the office of a minister of the gospel. You must have an image, an image that portrays the sanctified image of Jesus himself. You cannot be a joker in the pulpit. You have to have a solemn spirit, a spirit of dedication, a spirit that shows that your mind has a lot of deep contemplation of deep spiritual truths, and as a result of that, you do not allow trifle things and common things to take your mind away of things that are so solemn and so important for the salvation of billions. Yes, my dear people. And this is why we are being told here that the person is handling the bread of God. Now, if we go to verse 8, it says, Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for he offered the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, Yahweh, will sanctify you, am holy. End of quote. Did you see that? So, the priest is being dedicated to God. He has to live a right way. He is told things not to do. And we are told that when he's been inaugurated, inaugurated, thou shalt sanctify him therefore, for he offered the bread of thy God, which is the word of God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, Yahweh, which sanctify you, am holy. Did you see that? 
So in other words, just as how God is holy, this person must be holy like that. In other words, he must be a solemn person. He must be grave, yet cheerful, yet a person with softness in his mind, a person with consideration in his eyes, a person who, when you look into his eyes, you see sympathy and care for people. And he must be so, what we call, reclusant from self, that when you look at this minister of the gospel, you see no self-exaltation, because he recognizes that it is not he himself that does the blessing to people, but that it is God himself that does the blessing, and he wants to be a totally selfless channel for God. Yes, my dear people. So he ought to have a spirit, an experience of reserve from folly, reserve from corruption, and totally dedicated, introspective, unseen, not pushing himself up, not seeking recognition, not boasting about himself, not exalting himself based upon the works that he did for God, but a quiet person, barely seen, dedicated to God with a spirit of holiness, because it is in the presence of God that he is doing his work. You would remember that David himself, when he took the Ark of the Covenant to bring it into a place for God and that there was what we call rejoicing in the streets and there were people holding various songs and practices and so on to rejoice about the Lord because the Ark, where did she where the beautiful glory of God was manifested, where the doxa glory of God was manifested, was on a cart, and two oxen were carrying it because it was forbidden for people to touch the ark on pain of death. And David was dancing and rejoicing that a holy God was going to be among his people where he was carrying the ark. But then something happened. One of the guys attending the oxen behind felt that he was so righteous, felt that he was so holy in his mind that he could touch the ark and nothing will happen to him, which is a kind of presumptuous boasting. And as the, the ox were carrying this ark, and they reach an uneven part of the ground, what happened? The cat leaned a bit, and this guy reached out his hand and touched the ark and immediately he was struck down. Immediately he was stricken with death because he touched the ark. Now, there are many lessons that can be drawn from this, but the chief lesson we are looking at here is the holiness of God. God is so holy. God is so reverent. He is so above all of his creation. There is none like him. He is God only. That to presume to touch this thing, this ark, when it was forbidden of you by God, he looked for that trouble. You can't be helping God while you are transgressing his law. You cannot be going against what God says and claim you are helping God. And this person must recognize the holiness of God. And so all of us must recognize the holiness of God. He should have. And we should be careful how we handle holy things. As a minister of the gospel, your, de your demeanor should be holy. You can't be a minister of the gospel walking down the street in a short pants and a jersey with some kind of thing right up on it and not even a Bible with you and you are just this kind of a famous person waving to everybody, smiling to everybody but a lack of sanctity in your demeanor. You have to carry yourself 
that when people see you, they see the Lord, they see holiness, they are convicted of the truth. This is how you have to carry yourself. And this is the reason why we are saying, when you are following Yahweh, you have to move different. Yes, my dear people. If we turn to the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, and we read some verses here, here is what we are told. I quote, I, we read from uh, verse 14 to 16 of chapter 1. I quote, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. So when we were ignorant, we didn't know better. We followed certain lusts that we had. Lust for self-exaltation, lust for recognition, all kind of lust for material things and passions. And we are told here, when you are an obedient child of God now, you do not fashion yourself according to the former lust which you had in your ignorance. So in other words, you are developing a spiritual image, a spiritual personality, personality traits that are different to what you had before. And we continue, it tells us, but as he which had called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. Did you see that? So in all manner of your conversation, you're supposed to be holy. The way you live, you're supposed to be holy. Just as God who called you is holy. Because you do not fashion yourself according to the arrogant ways, the rumor mongering ways, the proud ways, just willing to talk about people, repeat things about people that you hear, and not about spiritual things. You see, you have to be so dedicated to God that you bring in a new culture. Somebody comes to speak evil about somebody, you show the science of salvation to help that person. That's how you're supposed to operate. Somebody comes and make a whole big joke about politics and a whole joke about thing, you show what God thinks about it. You show what is supposed to be the right position to bless and help people. Because your demeanor is different. You're holy in your ways and in the way you carry yourself. But it goes on. It tells us this. Again, in verse 16. Because, as it is written, be holy for I am holy. End of quote. So what do we have here? We have here... Peter is quoting from Leviticus and he's telling us that we should be holy because Yahweh himself is holy. When you have this spirit of dedication to God, you're so dedicated to his cause that as far as you're concerned, all you want is that the glory of God be seen. You hide yourself. You show yourself to be nothing because God is everything in the sense that God is the holiest. He is the Holy One, according to the scripture. Holiness means God-onliness. So he's the Holy One. God only, he is one. So he's completely not like us. All his ways are different. All his ways are high and exalted and holy. We are nothing like him. Therefore, we're supposed to have full humility, complete humility before God, humbling ourselves before Him and beseeching Him for help, for mercy to help others. Yes, my dear people. And so, if we continue to look at this same chapter, we go to verse 22. Here is what we're told in verse 22 of this same chapter. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another 
with a pure heart fervently. Did you see that, my dear people? So many things are said in this one little verse here. We are told you're supposed to purify yourself in obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit, which means to say that you're supposed to have contact with the Holy Spirit of God. Notice, Holy Spirit of God. You're supposed to have contact with the Holy Spirit, who is the one that unfolds these truths to your mind that changes you. You must remember, you don't just take up a book and read a book like a secular person, or, or take up the Bible, read the Bible like a secular book, like a secular person, and train yourself into ethics. No, that's humanistic. You must remember, you depend upon the Holy Spirit to unfold truth from the Scriptures to you, to flash on your mind, reveal truths of the plan of salvation, to flash the faith of Jesus on your mind, since you just shall live by faith. And when you flash these truths upon your mind, those truths have in them the divine nature exalted as the point of glory in the rationalism of the scripture. And as the divine nature is exalted as the point of glory in the rationalism of the scripture, this touches your mind and this sanctifies you. It makes you have high regard for God and totally deny all earthliness and selfishness. Yes, my dear people. And this exercise of sanctification takes place daily in your life through the Word of God. And when this takes place in your mind, you must remember what is taking place here. You are purifying yourself in obeying the truth through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one changing you, transforming you. How? Giving your consciousness a higher value, a higher view, filling you with humility, crushing human self-exaltation and glory in the dust as nothing, making you have reverent submission to God in your consciousness, in your psyche. That is the change that is going on, that in your personality traits, you humble yourself to these truths. Yes, my dear people. So your trait will be one of peace. Your personality trait will be one of care and concern for others because you see the world is coming to an end and you want people to be saved. You see people filled with blindness, filled with darkness. They just don't know. They are so ignorant of the truth. But you want them to know. You want them to understand the truth because you want them to be saved. And as you see this, you do your best to stretch forth your hands to help them. Yes, my dear people. But the scripture also further tells us in it, since it is so packed with material, it says, through the Spirit unto unframed love of the brethren. There we go again. You have unhypocritical love to your brethren. You really mean it for them. You feel for them. You watch them and you want them to be high in their contemplation of the divine nature. You want them to be sanctified in their obedience. You want to see that love of God soften their human personality traits, making them cheerful, making them very kind, making them considerate in their homes, in their environment, so that when you talk to them, you're just meeting a nice person made so by Christ. That's what you want. And since that was, that's what you want, you making sure, you make sure that you love them unhypocritically, with unfrained love. In other words, you love them with the love of God, and you're not a hypocrite pretending to love, because there are many smiling faces that tell lies. There are many smiling faces and greetings, but behind it is distaste, rejection, confusion in the mind, holding people's records of the past in their mind, and some of them are not even records. Most of them are your own interpretation and speculations. 
but you're not holding the love of God in your mind for the person and your wish for the person in the truth. That is a love that is not true love. But if you have the true love, you wouldn't hold those evils in your mind. But you would relate to the person with unfeigned love, unhypocritical love, as Peter is telling us here. And he says, love of the brethren. And then he says, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. In other words, your mind must be pure when you're loving your fellow men. You must really mean it with your heart. There's some people, they talk to you and they smile and they say, hello, brother, such and such, but they don't really mean it in their heart because they have a whole different agenda. They have divisiveness. They have hate. They see you in the past and they don't see you as a person in Christ Jesus. And as a result of that, they may smile, they may say hello, but they don't really love you as we are told with a pure heart and they don't do it fervently. But you must be so changed as a Christian that every time a person meets you, it could be any time of the day, it could be three years later, they must um, always meet this unfailing kindness in you. Or, if a person is in transgression and doing evil, they must always see this solemnity, this graveness, this judgment in your eyes from God, but yet a softness and a mercy calling you to repent. They must see you as a person easy to entreat, easy to beg, so that as you pass in the streets, and vagrants are wrong and they see you, the first thing the vagrant recognizes in you is that you're different from the others around him. He sees you as a person full of sympathy, full of mercy, and easy to beg for something, although he just wants to buy his coke many times with the money. It's not that you're going to give away things just so, but you watch back with a reserve, with a sympathy, with a hope, or if himself you have to cut off some of those impressions from your eyes from that person, knowing that the person is violent and will take advantage, you're supposed to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit as you're walking in the streets that you can know to do all of these things because you are living holy and you're walking holy and you have fervent love for your fellow men. Do you know what is fervent love for your fellow men? Fervent love for your fellow men is a kind of a love that it continues right through irregardless. The person may be evil, they may hate you, they may say terrible things against you, but in your mind, you have sympathy and sorrow for that person that you would pray for the person over and over in private. They may not know, but God knows, and it is God you are addressing. And you pray to God for that person over and over that the person may change. Yes, my dear people, we'll have to stop now, but we'll have to talk about this more again. But this is the kind of holiness that is needed in the demeanor of ministers of the gospel. This is the spirit that is needed and it must be genuinely there, put there by God, because you're not doing the work of God on your own. Like if you're just walking, so just ethically doing what you want to do. You're doing the work of God, being directed by God himself. And you want the blessings of God. And you want the success of God. This is what the world needs as the end is near. And you want to be genuine for everything. Yes, my dear people. So, if anyone wants to study, call us at 6250446. 6250446 will give you this study plus others that went before. And may God bless you until we meet again in Jesus' holy name.